Um, I sort of retired not very long after I interviewed uh, George Lutz and didn't look real hard at the paranormal world. In fact, uh, I was out of the country for a long time. So all of this hit me and hit me pretty hard. And I felt, you know what, Um, I did that quite seriously on the air. And I have a responsibility to tell the real story to the audience. So we've done it. Well, now, and you've also interviewed, and you also interviewed Malachi Martin, who was oh, one yes. of the people who consulted yes. on this case. And Malachi Martin, I come to find out um, from a, a CIA officer, was actually working for the CIA at that time. What? Yep. Um, he what? told the story. He told the story. This person who shall go nameless. On UFO Hunters, we were shadowed, not shadowed, but our paths were intersected a lot by people who were working for the government. And they identified themselves. This was not some strange men in black thing. These were people who said, look, I'm with the NSA, I'm with the CIA, um, I just want to talk to you. And this particular case happened out on Long Island. And so we were talking about Malachi Martin and this person who wanted to do his own life story but really couldn't because he'd have to get us at the Board of Review, told the story of how his con- – very briefly, his contact in, in NGO, um, a government – a non-government organization investigating UFOs, his, the person who came to retrieve a piece of uh, UFO data technology actually was Malachi Martin. What? <laughs> I was interviewed recently, by the way, for a documentary on Malachi, uh, a British documentary coming out, uh, I'm not sure when, pretty soon. And um, I was happy to do it. Malachi was an amazing, amazing man. Uh, but you're telling me he was a CIA agent? He was a, C- he was a cooperating individual uh, with cool. the CIA. Well, a lot of people do that. Do you have any knowledge? You can't name your source, right? I cannot do that. No. All right. Um, do you have any knowledge what the nature of his involvement with the CIA was? In other words, what was he doing? Yes. Okay, fire away. He was part of he was part of a group that was investigating all kinds of paranormal phenomena. It had to do with exorcism, had to do with um, out of body experiences. But this particular group was working. Uh, There were people from former administrations that were in this group, and they were basically a funding operation. They were channeling money to individuals or groups that would carry out investigations into the paranormal. And in this one case, uh, there was some kind of college professor, a scholar, who they had commissioned to, to go to Egypt because there was a story floating around. Can we slow down for one moment? I mean, you just sure. said something that doesn't make sense to me. Why would the government, through the CIA or any other arm, funnel money uh, to people investigating the paranormal? Well, they did it with remote viewing. That's, I mean, that's well, they the did. All right. Yeah, they did. With it. That's right. But otherwise, the government is not known to be... Uh, a big contributor uh, with funds to anything paranormal, other than, as you point out, uh, remote viewing. I'm including UFOs in the paranormal. I'm including um, human beings with abilities to manipulate things. I mean, Yuri Geller, Joe, can certainly talk to Yuri Geller's involvement with American Intelligence Services. Mm -hmm. Um, So they were investigating aspects of human behavior or human abilities okay. that had to do with the paranormal. That and I can this, see. That I can and see. And in, in this one particular case, uh, there was a story floating around that there was not a, a, a computer disk. That would be a mischaracterization, but there was a device on which there was stored for thousands and thousands of years, and this was in Egypt, um, alien technology. And supposedly, this scholar, whom uh, who was commissioned, found it, acquired it, and refused to turn it over to this group, to this um, government group. Refused to turn it over. He said, "I'm going to sell it to the highest bidder. How much are you going to put up with?" 
or how much you're going to put up to get this back. And what this officer told me was that from time to time, various officers are given what are known as cowboy jobs or black bag jobs, literally off the books operations, go get something back, go find something, go terminate someone with extreme prejudice. They'll be handed these jobs. His job was to get a hold of this guy, to get his hands on this piece of technology, and to let them know he had it and wait for it until they sent a representative to pick it up. And that's exactly what he did. He found this guy. He made him an offer, an offer that was better than um, than what the French had offered. They were in Paris. Uh, and rather than simply hand him the money, he basically uh, knocked him out, anesthetized him. Uh, a group came in, took the guy's body. He doesn't know whatever happened to it. He presumes the guy was killed. And then the person who showed up to get that piece of technology in this hotel room was Malachi Martin. My goodness, Bill. You didn't give me any idea this was coming tonight, which is fine. I love surprises, but holy, <laughs> holy dog poop. Um, oh my God. So a device, an ancient device uh, that somehow, uh, even though it's ancient, stores information, um, very, very important information. It's, it's sort of put up for bid. Uh, we win. Malachi, acting for the CIA, collects it. All right? That's, uh, that's correct. The, the person oh, went yeah. rogue. Yeah, yeah. He would not turn it over. He said, I'm putting it up for the highest bidder. Supposedly, the French won. He was meeting him in a hotel. He was meeting whatever bureau was handling this for the French in Paris. That's where this individual from the CIA crossed his path, offered him more. The guy basically said, sure, the highest bidder. They met in a hotel room, and this person dispatched him. Why would they dispatch Malachi to uh, retrieve this device? Just curious. That's the key. Uh, that's the key question. Uh -huh. Because Malachi was one of the individuals who was, how can I put it, almost like the historian or the scholar or the expert for this group. He was vetting the kinds of applications uh, or candidates that this group was examining. He was vetting them. It seems to me uh, that the very existence, I, I mean, Malachi was a very, very conservative Catholic. Yes, but As he was a know. Catholic who was let out of his regular orders by the yes. Pope. Yes, I know. And one wonders, and one wonders, I mean, what was underneath that? My theory always was that Malachi was far more valuable um, as a secular priest than he was in regular orders. Oh, I think that's fair. Uh, you know that uh, the manner of his death is somewhat um, suspicious. Turn that over to Joe. Joe knows all about yeah. that one. Oh, really? I'm not oh, even yeah. sure I want to ask, but ask I shall. Uh, Joel, do you really know something about Malachi's death? What I heard is that he was uh, kept out of communication uh, by the sisters who were caring for him, uh, that he fell down the steps, and it, that is the manner of his death. Now, there are people who have said, oh, I th there's some conspiracy here. He didn't fall down anything. He got pushed, at least. Uh, what do you know, Joel? Well, there's a, 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 a thread of truth that runs through all of those versions he had a very beautiful apartment on the east side of Manhattan. He was living the way any of us live. Yes. You know, house, apartment, whatever. He was not living in a rectory or anything like that. Right. He was living with a woman on the east side of Manhattan. He had a, a lady friend. And when he fell down, he was on a ladder looking for a book. He was one, one of those books, you know, those ladders you see in bookstores. I do. That whirl back and forth. He was on one of those because he had an extensive library. I mean, a really extensive library. Yeah. He was looking for something, and he either fell down or was pushed. That's exactly right. Now, there's a version that says he fell down a flight of stairs. Frankly, I don't know that that makes sense given where he lived, but it is more than likely he was pushed rather than he fell. Because Malachi, for all of his brilliance, and he really was, 
was still a man of the cloth in the sense that he was a, a, a deeply religious man. Yes. And I, don't you think? Oh, yes. Uh, that, that was my impression of him. No question about it. None at yeah. all. And I think everything, listen, if, if Bill tells it to you, I, I don't even question it. But that's that's my own personal opinion of, of, of Bill's veracity, of the truth he always tells about these things. But there is nonetheless the fact that the government, and I've had my dealings with them too, they would rather see him go quietly than have to worry about if he says something publicly, given that he had a a big uh, a big platform, shall we say? Don't forget, he wrote dozens of books. Yes, well, he had a rather regular platform with me, and he was very, right. very outspoken. That's right. I met him, and I interviewed him, but nowhere near to the extent you did. I don't even pretend to. But okay, so do you honestly think that uh, the CIA, for example? Mm -hmm. uh, may have been concerned that he would begin opening up about some of what he had done mm -hmm. with regard to everything you just talked about, this device, yes. whatever it was. And yes. His My God. I, I certainly do. And there's no question that government intelligence agencies will approach people who they think can help them with information of the kind that Malachi Martin would have had access to. Just the kind of thing Bill told you about, the kind of uh, scholarly <sighs> research, the context that he would have had in the Vatican, in Rome, in his native Ireland, what he had in the United States. He was a world figure. He wasn't just, you know, he wasn't your local, I'm not putting anybody down, but he wasn't, you know, your local parish priest. And if they thought your local parish priest knew anything, frankly, they'd be there too. I mean, they had come to visit us after certain programs. Why wouldn't, why, if we were local, why wouldn't? they do that with somebody like Malachi Martin? God, sure. I, okay. I, let's go back to the incident, if you want to call it that, in Paris. Uh, what do we now know about this device, if anything? Um, where did it end up? Was the knowledge retrieved? What, what was, I mean... All, all we know is this, that this particular non-official cover officer for the CIA was waiting in a hotel room. This was after this scholar's body, this person's body was removed. Yes. Malachi Martin shows up and basically takes possession. It was it was like it's not a disc, it was an oddly shaped flat right. object right. that could be read by something. So whether we actually had the technology to read it, because he said you couldn't put it in a computer and, and this was Long and this was before floppy disk drives were that common. Okay. So, but it was like a disk, and he said that what the person told him because he did have a conversation with this person before he gave him his injection, and what the person said was that that there was data on that disk, mathematical data, was the best he could explain. Was the best way he could explain it. Um, mathematical symbols and equations and things like that that he didn't understand, but that he believed that there would be people um, to whom that would make sense. And so Malachi was retrieving this not for the Vatican, not as a religious artifact, but for the CIA. But for a government group, and we know that the government outsources this stuff because – in your travels, can you can you travels, prove can you prove that Malachi was in Paris at on that day? I only have this person's story that tells me that. This is all I have is the story from one person, and this this was one of many stories. Don't tell me. All right, don't tell me who the person is because you can't. No, but, I'm not, but at least because, at uh, least I tell me not to use his at name. least tell me how highly placed he was. He was highly placed enough that when we went to certain places um, in the area where we were filming, everyone knew him. He seemed to know details about the right kinds of people uh, who would know certain kinds of secrets. He told me um, that his legend, legends basically is the cover story this, uh, this has, that his legend was 
that he had been a very high-ranking uh, consigliere to um, one of the top organized crime figures because that wow. figure was getting intelligence <laughs> on the drug trade from the Middle East. Oh, and God. so he was able to look over this person's shoulder and get some valuable intelligence about, for example, Hamas guarding drug shipments. All right. It seems like to me, Bill, certain aspects of this story would be verifiable. There was a death involved, right? There was a death involved, oh. and I don't know the person's name who oh, died. I, okay, but there was a death involved on a certain day. Uh, and yes. there, there would be record of Malachi Martin uh, either being or not being in uh, Paris, in fact, France, uh, on that day. So you could proceed to investigate some of this and try and verify at least the basic stuff, right? I could. The, the problem is this person's identity because he wanted to do a book. That was the whole point of this person's contacting me. Huh. And this was after the Corso book, and he said, look, I really want to – do a book about my life and my involvement with strange black box, black book things um, about my life, because I really want the people around me to at least know my story that I can't tell. And so we talked about that for a while. We visited a couple of publishers. He couldn't do it as nonfiction, so he wanted to do it as fiction. And this particular publisher uh, said we this will never fly as as a novel. Oh, I'm this sure. It really has to fly That's as right. nonfiction. It has right. to fly as a true story. And right. it will never, never get through the review board. Um, and so his pr presumably even his life might be in danger should he come out with this, yes? Yes, because of this and other stories where he did certain kinds of jobs for elements within the government that were off the books, that – I mean, I was stunned to hear some of these stories. And I so am I. I'm very none, stunned. None, sh not one shred of evidence that they're true. Do you have it? Just his word. Okay. Do you have any separate, uh, you just said no, uh, any separate evidence at all that Malachi Martin was involved with um, the CIA? Anything beyond that man's word? It's that person's word, but... Among the stories he was telling about how deep and pervasive the CIA and our intelligence agencies are, it's not just the CIA, it's DPMA and other kinds of DIA and other kinds of three-letter agencies, that he said that over the course of 60 years, that the pervasiveness of the intelligence community is such that people you, – you turn on the television and you see a news commentator whom you believe to be oh, it's really like either a centrist or a, really a, a liberal person. Right. That person's a listening post. Oh, I know. I, 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 here's what I will say that will support a little bit what you're saying generally. I, I do know for a fact that scholars, people who lecture internationally – High, uh, highly placed individuals in private society are indeed frequently approached by the CIA to do little jobs for them. Uh, if somebody's going into Burma, they might want to know the uh, the condition of an airport uh, or you know a runway or some sort of infrastructure information. I, I know that these contacts are made by the CIA and these people are used in this way. So. To that degree, I, I can verify that goes on, and but, and but that it went on with husband. Malachi Martin, Father Malachi Martin. Well, well, look at Valerie Plame's husband, who was an ambassador in uh, Niger. I mean, here's a guy who was not in the CIA. He was in the State Department, um, literally tasked by the CIA, go to Niger, find out if Saddam Hussein is buying yellow cake to yeah. make nuclear weapons. Yeah, well, boy, that's another show. Uh